So, we're down to mobile forensics. There's not much left to this course at all. You know, just a few more classes, and then the last class on May 15, uh, you'll find in the Canvas a chart of how many points it takes to get a final grade of A, B, and C and all that, so you can plan how to get the grade you, you want. And uh, all right, so let's talk about this nine. This, this uh, lecture nine has a lot of detail about cellular phones. I certainly don't expect you to memorize all this, just get the general uh, features of it. But there's the cell telephone network is extremely complicated. I took a course in um, uh, digital telephony, and I could not believe how complicated the telephone network is. It is really complicated because it's very old. And even the cellular network, which is not that old, is amazingly complicated. So a mobile switching center switches packets from one network path to another. And... Um, if you're trying to move to another carrier, then it goes to the public switch telephone network, which is the classic plain old television, uh, telephone network we've all been using. And so you have a mobile station, which is your phone and a SIM card working together. Then it goes into the base station subsystem. Then it goes to the network subsystem and then to the public switch telephone network to move across. It's all very much like the way IP packets travel across the internet. So the base transceiver statement is cell tower 200 feet high and it's got a base station controller that handles frequency and handoffs, and there's a limited number of phone calls this can handle at a certain period of time. It can be saturated. That's why you see so many repetitive arrays of antennas. Each one can only handle something like uh, 50 or 100 calls. I don't know the exact number. Now, the soft handoff is what you usually have, where if you're, like, moving, you connect to one tower, and then when the signal gets smaller and the signal from another tower gets bigger, you silently hand off to that one so you can continue your phone call. The same thing is true of wireless networks. If you move to a Wi-Fi network, you can move from one um, access point to another smoothly. Um, there is something called a hard handoff, which means you can only be handled by one uh, tower at a time. I don't know under what circumstances you'd do that, but that would be annoying. So now, you, if now that you know how it's structured, you can get some clue how the evidence works. What you see here is a pen register we talked about before. This is the simplest kind of evidence, and most people say you can get this without a search warrant. You just get the phone numbers they called, the time they called them, and how long the call was. This is often all you matter, all you care about. Um, you can do something like if you have a gang of people, you can arrest one member of the gang and then get the pen register of all the other members and see who called each other, and you'll find out who's in the gang. They'll all immediately call everybody, telling them, that one of their gang got arrested. Um, uh, law enforcement can also tell it to preserve records for 90 days uh, and extend it for an additional 90 days and such, which is pretty common. Are those ugly things going to be obsoleted by G5 to G10 networks? I do not know, but I doubt it. I don't think there's any way to get away from the fact that you're going to need these antennas all over the place. There are people that um, add plastic ornaments to them to make it look like trees and stuff, but um, uh, as far as I know, there is no upcoming technology that will get us away from having to have these antennas all over the place because they don't go very far. So, you know, you need another one of these every few blocks. All right. So the mobile station is your handset with the SIM card. So it is the hardware here with the battery and the antenna and such, and then a SIM card which contains the identifying numbers to identify your phone so you can receive calls. And so... You're looking for the International Mobile Equipment Identity Number, the IMEI number, to uniquely identify, identify it. So there's a smart card that identifies you on a GSM network. That's the SIM card. For something called UTMS, it's the universal SIM, and on it goes. There's various ways, different versions of these numbers to identify your phone. All right. And uh, in America, the phones are often locked to just one carrier. Now, under the Obama administration, a rule was passed saying they cannot enforce that anymore. They have to unlock it on Raquan. This went around for years. But anyway, um, it's a common issue to lock to one carrier. Supposedly, unlocking is now legal. All right. U.S. phones also have an FCC ID indicating that they're authorized to operate in uh, federal communication condition controls because the federal communication condition regulates who's allowed to use the radio frequencies in America. Um, so the SIM card is this little tiny thing, sort of like a floppy disk that can store some data, and it's got your IMSI um, number, it's got your mobile country code and so on, it's got an integrated circuit card, a serial number on it, and so on. Um, and uh, quite a lot of data goes on that SIM card, as we're going to see. So when you uh, turn on your phone and connect to the, the um, network, it will check to see that you are in fact a paying customer and authorized to connect to it. 
So you pass a home location register as a database of subscribers. There's a visitor location register, roaming subscribers, and so on. And it goes to an authentication center, which has encryption keys. So you got a mobile network operator that operates the network, like Verizon, T-Mobile, and AT&T. These are the people that actually run the backbone network. And then there are mobile virtual network operators, uh, like Google Fi, that run on other people's hardware. The same thing is true of internet service providers. There are the main tier one internet service providers like AT&T, and then there are the smaller ones like Sonic that actually run over AT&T's wires. Because the law, they tried restricting other people from using their wires, and uh, they were forced by law to allow other people to move their traffic down their wires. So uh, we've been through 2G up to 5G, very generation tier. 2G used time division multiple access, which just cuts the traffic on the wire into time slices. So you get a few microseconds, then the other person gets a few microseconds, and so on. Um, and the, quite a few of them are still using that. Um, GSM was created in Europe, and it uses time division multiple access. <coughs> and uh, all right, uh, code division multiple access is another way to do it with spread spectrum communication technology which I think uses different frequencies for different transmissions. All right. And so your SIM card has a lot of information just on the card. Uh, an EEPROM is the writable part of the SIM card, and that has a hierarchical file system just like the uh, SSD in your computer or your phone. And so it's got encryption algorithms. There's three primary areas, the master file root, the dedicated files, and elementary files. Elementary files is where subscriber information is stored. Your contact names and numbers, uh, the cell networks you attempted to connect to, which will track the physical location of your phone, list of outgoing calls, and other things. Um, I couldn't find on Canvas the project ML. Well, if you can't find it, then just put it in the, uh, in the chat or whatever that, that email thing is in Canvas. Um, yeah, okay. All right. Uh, supposedly it's in all of them now, but if it isn't, you can turn it in by email or by, by sending a message inside Canvas. All right. Anyway, um, so, the, um, so the SIMs are pin protected these days, and you only get three guesses before it's locked. So in fact, if you just get a SIM that you gather from a crime scene and you don't have access to the pin, then you've got a real problem. Now, you can get in with a pin unlocking key, which you can get from the carrier. So you could send a court order to the carrier and compel them to get your way through the police and get a pin unlocking key, and that's what you need to do. Now, on older phones, you could clone the, the SIMs, but now they have anti-cloning features, and that's more difficult. There are, of course, hacking tools like Celebrite that can punch through all this. Yeah? About eSIMs, you say? Well, I don't really know. I mean, I know they essentially serve the same purpose, but they're, they're another version. I, it's complicated, and I don't have it all straight. Does a carrier have to comply with a PUK order? Yes, I think they do. Um, just like anybody does in America, if you get a court order demanding you to put out to provide data, you have to provide it unless you resist, and then you send your lawyers to argue that you don't have to provide it like Apple did. When the FBI went to Apple and they wanted to get in a phone, Apple pushed back. So you either have to comply or you have to get a lawyer to make some argument as to why you have some legal basis for not complying. But yeah. Complying is the cheapest way. Yeah, well, it depends. I mean, if they're asking for something that you really don't want to do because Apple didn't want to do it because their marketing is that they, they preserve your privacy. So they felt like it would harm their business to comply. And so that's, that's an option. And that's also like Snowden's email service. Snowden had an encrypted email carrier, and his whole point was he would never give data to the government. So when they submitted him with a national security letter, he just shut down the company. And then he found out that even shutting down the company doesn't mean he can not comply. <laughs> And the problem with national security letters is they're secret. You can't even tell your lawyers about them, so you can't really fight back. That's why they're really unfair. But a normal court order is a public document, and you can just go to court and resist it. And if you have some kind of argument, you might be able to uh, resist complying. And I think the big carriers like Apple, Apple and AT&T and stuff, they do resist some of them. Well, Apple more than AT&T. AT&T hardly ever resists anything the government asked them to do. When after 9-11, the government said, just hand over everything on the entire telephone and internet backbone to us with no court order at all, AT&T just did it. Even though that blatantly violates the Fourth Amendment, they did it for years, and then Congress passed a special exemption so they couldn't be sued for it. Because AT&T is practically a branch of the government. 
but other carriers have a more hostile relationship with the government. Even the, even the lawyer crime privilege can, can still not protect you know, the, the information? We, we even what? Lawyer client, client privilege? Oh, yeah, well, lawyer client privilege um, is one defense, yes. Yeah, but the, 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 the privilege cannot even seal the, the, talk, the secret talk between the. <laughs> well, um, a national security letter, I th imagine, would punch through lawyer-client privilege, but I don't really know. This is a tough question. Um, and I think the laws are very unclear about national security letters because they're still so secret. For normal um, subpoenas, I think that would be a perfectly valid defense. You could go to court and say this was a lawyer-client communication, and therefore we're not giving it to you. But, um, yeah. Yeah, and as you say, there's even charts you can find from like the EFF that will say which providers are more likely to hand over your data to law enforcement. They vary in how much they resist it. Anyway, so, uh, all right. So um, here's Legal Intercept, by the way. Rich communication services maintain the same legal standards as SMS. So um, you can legally intercept them, they say, like SMS. So you have a court order. They can hand over the messages you've been sending. And then there's mobile operating systems, of course. The only two currently in use are Android and iOS for all practical purposes. Android is basically a version of Linux modified by Google. And so here's some common partitions. We've seen doing the Android forensics here. The boot is the boot code for the device. Here's the system, uh, operating system files, recovery image, cache, MISC. And the only thing you usually care about is data. This is where all the user installed apps and data is. So everything about what the user has been doing is here. The apps they installed, the messages, the emails, and everything you want. All the rest of this you probably don't care about for forensic purposes because that's just the operating system and doesn't really tell you anything about what the person's been doing with it. Um, all right. So then there's, there's a, in the data folder, there's a list of all the packages as well as a copy of all the APK files. So there's an issue with um, evidence admissibility. Uh, if it's encrypted, you'd have to circumvent the encryption. Now, the only way to do that easily is to get the PIN. You find it written down, or you get the suspect to voluntarily tell you the PIN, or they're using biometrics and you hold it in front of their face or something. Other than that, you have to pay for an expensive tool, like Celebrite, typically. Sometimes you can get by with cheaper tools like gray key we'll talk about. Celebrite is the most expensive and most powerful tool, and as I've said before, they claim they can punch through every version of encryption on every iPhone, and I think every Android. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but it's certainly reasonably close to being true. Um, there are other ways to get data off a phone. You can do JTAG, chip off, and ISP. JTAG is a device that lets you connect a hardware chip to another chip and suck the data off it. This is what's commonly done in hardware hacking. You have a device, a hardware, it has firmware on a chip, and you're not supposed to be able to see the firmware, so you solder a JTAG under certain pins, and then you can copy the data off the data store, get a copy of the ROM. Um, now, it might be encrypted or something, but you can get a copy of it. Um, so here's a riff box used to acquire from a circuit board on a cell phone. You can get a full dump of the memory by getting the contents here by attaching this JTAG chip to your phone. Um, if you can't use Celebrite or you don't have it, then JTAG would be your next thing. The last resort is Chip Off Forensics. Uh, drive savers will do this for you. Chip Off Forensics is something you typically use because the phone has been destroyed. Uh, the motherboard is, bro is broken and everything. Then you take the chips off one by one and you suck the data off the chips by putting them in a special harness, like a chip adapter. This is really difficult and complicated, and then you have a complicated mess of data you have to reassemble. Um, so it's expensive and difficult, but technically you're getting all the data. Um, all right, and in-system programming is another way where you connect a memory chip to access the files, less invasive. There's also emergency download mode for some Android phones that will let you boot up to a special operating system and you might be able to get in. Androids are secured by a pin or by a password or by a pattern lock where you trace out some shape on the screen or by biometrics like a thumbprint or a face print. From a viewpoint of um, preserving your data from lawful seizure, biometrics is by far the weakest because it is legal to hold the phone in front of your face or put your finger on it without your consent, because that is not speech. The First Amendment mean, has, says you are allowed to speak, any, say anything you want, and it has been recently interpreted about since about the 60s as you can also refuse to speak. But 
Your fingerprint and your face are not speech, and you do not have any legal right to not provide them on demand. So if you use biometrics on your phone, the police can get in. That way, if you use something like a PIN or a password, you can refuse to provide it, and they cannot legally compel you to provide it. Of course, there are tools to try to break in. Now, if your device has USB debugging enabled, then you can just connect with ADB and suck the data off, and we've done that in the projects. That's nice, um, but of course, you have to have already logged in to the phone to do that. Um, all right, the applications have SQLite data in them. They're written in Java, and so this is all in databases on the phone, and that's what tools like, um, like Autopsy gather and make easy to grab. So there's standard operating procedures for handling handset evidence from National Institute of Standards. You should validate your tools, make sure that the tools are uh, tested and considered reliable. Um, then uh, when you seize, you first you secure the, the scene, you put up yellow tape or something, make sure nobody's going to be wandering in changing the scene, then you document it, like taking photographs or videotape of everything, then you collect the evidence, you want to preserve the value of the evidence, so you package the portable devices in containment bags that block radio, so they cannot receive messages and perhaps remote wipe signals while you're transporting them. Well, this means that they will turn the radio up to maximum power trying to reach a cell phone tower, so they'll rapidly drain the battery. So typically you do connect them to an external battery while you're doing this so they don't go dry on you because if the phone shuts all the way down, then when you restart it, you're probably going to need a pin or password to get in. And so it would be better if the phone is already logged in and on to leave it in that condition to take it back to your lab to analyze it. Um, if you want to block its connection to the telephone network, you could use in principle a signal jammer to block phone calls. The problem is that is completely illegal, even for law enforcement, because people might have to make a 911 call for a heart attack or something. Uh, uh, this is a big deal. Like 10 years ago, uh, movie theaters tried to get signal jammers to stop people from getting cell phone calls during the movie, and they found out the same thing, that it's not legal, because uh, telephone calls are considered a possible emergency thing, and it's illegal to block them. So gray key is a a common law enforcement tool to try to guess the key on, law, on iOS devices. It works for some of them. By doing something like resetting the machine after every nine guesses so it can have another nine guesses, it can eventually try uh, at least four-digit pins. It can usually get in. It's a bit pin thing, mobile edit forensics. Paraben has one. And like I say, Celebrite, the most famous, most powerful, most expensive tool that can really punch through everybody's pin to get the data off the phone. Um, all right. So... Um, and as I mentioned before, SS, um, SSD-based devices like cell phones typically do not have any deleted files you can recover. They have garbage extraction going on in the background, so anything that's deleted is usually completely erased right away and not going to be recovered. Want a Faraday phone to use more power? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, they can use a Faraday cage to block signals without draining batteries. No, I don't think they can, because when your cell phone tries to call out to a, a tower, it will detect that it didn't get an answer, so it will turn up the power to maximum and keep calling, trying to reach the tower. So uh, you have to uh, have an external battery. As far as I know, there's no way to prevent your phone from draining a lot of battery when you put it in a, uh, a radio-blocking container. All right, so then you, and by the way, if you can't do any of this fancy stuff, like make a complete image of it or chip off forensics or any of that stuff, you can always just take pictures of the phone and page through the messages, and you can have a little rig like this to hold up your camera, or you can do it by hand, because that's evidence. Like I said before, even if you don't have a technical device to really get all the evidence, you can see some of the evidence just by manipulating the buttons on the phone, and that's evidence. The real evidence is the human testifying in court anyway. So even if you don't get all the evidence, but you get some of it, it's evidence. All right. So um, you'd have to get a warrant for a cell phone um, unless you have exigent circumstances like an emergency or you have permission, you're going to need a warrant to seize the phone. And then, of course, you'd have to have a complete description of the cell phone and the evidence. So that's what I wanted to show you there. And let's take a look at a Kahoot, which is going to be uh, this one here, Mod 9. By the way, I should mention our um, 
team for that uh, that hacking competition. They won it again, like they did last year. Uh, I'll get the name of it over here so I'm not blocking it. Um, National Cyber League. We are one of the top five winners. Maybe I don't know which one of the top five we are, but there'll be a uh, award ceremony next week. I'll be there. They, they won. They were like I think they're third in the nation last year or something. So anyway, they did well, very well again. We have a very powerful NCL team. I'll have more details about it after the ceremony. I just got the email today, though, telling us that they scored in the top five. So that's good. And I think I had about 12 students, I know, that went in there and played in the gymnasium to earn some points, so that's good. It's absolutely a good thing to do. Well, maybe I got everybody that's coming. Ah, oh, okay, I'll wait a few more seconds. got plenty of time. Well, I guess that's it. So which one of these is the cell phone? station is the cell phone. All right. Which value uniquely identifies your handset? So which MSC item is the part that it issues the encryption keys? Now the authentication center, a logical choice. So which partition on an Android phone is the most important? Size data, where all the user data is, all the rest of it doesn't tell you much of anything except which version of Android it is and whether they put on their patches, and that's usually not very important. Thank you.